Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Procalcitonin, PCT, Catalyst, and Antibiotic Stewardship. I am Megan Pascal of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar is presented by LabRoots and brought to you by Abbott. To learn more, visit corelaboratory.abbott.com. We encourage you to participate today by submitting any questions you may have during the presentation. To do so, simply type them in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. You may also submit any technical issues here if you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation. I'd like to now welcome our speaker, Dr. James F. Neuenschwander, Emergency Physician at Doctors Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Dr. Neuenschwander, you may now begin your presentation. Hello, I'm Jim Neuenschwander. I'm an attending physician at Doctors Hospital in Columbus, Ohio in the United States. I'm also an adjunct associate professor at The Ohio State University. I'm really happy that you could all join us today. I know you're coming in from all over the world, Central and South America, Europe, maybe some places in Asia, Canada. I just wanna thank you all for taking time to talk about this. Um, this is the first time I've done this presentation to an international audience. So I thought about maybe spicing it up a little bit, um, changing my hair, singing and dancing, uh, something like that. And then I remembered um, I can't sing or dance. So I'm just going to make it as um, fun for you as possible. I was going to um, say chocolate is one of the wonderful things in all of life that we look at. And what I'd love to have you all do is put in the chat box what country you're in and your favorite chocolate uh, from your country. Um, my favorite chocolate is actually not from the U.S. I'm going to disclose that later in the middle of the talk and hope that you stay tuned. Uh, just for complete transparency, I am videotaping this before, so I will be able to read your comments in the chat, so don't be afraid to uh, put those in there. So what we're gonna talk about today is procalcitonin use in 2022. How are we using it? How does it benefit us as practitioners? How do we care for our patients better? These are my disclosures, and these are the objectives today. We're going to discuss procalcitonin, antibacterial stewardship and sepsis and lower respiratory tract infections, illustrate the impact of procalcitonin on emergency department and ICU decision-making, and also demonstrate the economic benefits of procalcitonin, which are numerous. So let's go back all the way to 2018 BC, also known as before COVID, that's what the BC stands for. And one of the cases that I first started using uh, procalcitonin as a test about three or four years ago. And so I'm kind of a neophyte in the U.S. because there are people that have been doing this far longer than me. And yet um, this is one of the first cases. And I think it's a great case. So if you haven't picked up procalcitonin yet, don't be embarrassed. There's still time to use it. If you've been using it for a while, hopefully this case will help illustrate some things that will be helpful to you. And this was a very sweet 90 year old female that came to my emergency department because I'm an ER doctor. She had a history of hypertension, reactive airway disease. She had recently been in the hospital for bronchitis about three weeks to a month before. Uh, and now she was coming in with shortness of breath and a cough and her pulse oximetry was low. So her vital signs are as follows. 183 over 79 was her blood pressure. Heart rate was 73. Respiratory rate was an honest 20 times a minute. Temperature of 97.9 and her pulse ox was 89% on room air. We got a chest x-ray, which showed a new linear opacity in the right lung base, um, suggestive of subsegmental atelectasis or an infiltrate. And so basically I had a nine year old woman with um, a pneumonia that was bouncing back within uh, 60 days of the time she had last been in the hospital. So I did what I felt was safe at that time. Again, not horribly comfortable with procalcitonin. I gave her hospital acquired community or excuse me, hospital acquired pneumonia antibiotics through the IV and I put her in the hospital. I did grow, draw, draw a procalcitonin and on day three, they checked another procalcitonin, each of which were low. And on day four, it was still low. Her RSV positive, she was uh, RSV positive um, 
on day four that popped. And so the antibiotics were stopped. And this is a great example of, hey, we can start antibiotics if the clinical picture is concerning. And even though we had a low procalcitonin, we waited, rechecked the procalcitonins, they stayed low. So this was a viral pneumonia. At two week follow-up, her physician ordered a uh, CT scan of her chest without IV contrast. Um, one of the embarrassing elements of why healthcare is so expensive in the United States. I don't know why he didn't just order a repeat chest X-ray, but he got a CT scan. And I did give him a little bit of grief about that and said, hey, Billy, why you got to get uh, a CT scan? You're just checking on pneumonia. And he said, well, I also wanted to take a look at uh, making sure that her pneumonia had resolved and she had a wedge fracture on T6. So I wanted to take a look at that. Nonetheless, the bottom line was that she did very well at follow-up. She didn't need antibiotics for her pneumonia. And that's where procalcitonin comes in a lot of times for us is saying, hey, there's a pneumonia on x-ray. Do I really need antibiotics in this situation? And in this case, she didn't need them. We stopped them and she did very well in follow-up. So how does procalcitonin work? Well, there's these toll-like receptors on the um, surface of cells. And when those are stimulated by, in this cartoon, a green looking glob of bacteria in this case, there are messages that are then sent and IL-1, TNF, IL-6 are um, stimulated and then released into the blood system. The challenge with these signals is that they're sometimes blocked by medications, uh, disease processes, so they aren't all, always helpful to us. So what happens with procalcitonin though is that it is um, transcribed, translated, and then released back into the blood system in a manner that is similar to the amount of the severity of the bacteria. So in other words, if there's a lot of bacteria that are stimulating the cell surfaces, then we get a large amount of procalcitonin released, which is very helpful to us. If there's a lot of procalcitonin, then we're going to think, hey, there's a big bacterial burden and this is somebody that needs antibiotics. And then I'm going to follow their procalcitonin to make sure that it's actually coming down and that the antibiotics I'm utilizing are effective in fighting this disease. So in uh, also in a schematic form here, uh, we can see that if somebody comes in after the procalcitonin is peaked, which usually takes about 24 hours or so. So in the first three hours, I don't know what people are like in Central South America, Canada and other places, but generally people don't sneeze and then run into the emergency department. So in those first three to six hours that somebody's infected, um, we're not gonna see a big peak of procalcitonin, but most people wait to come to the hospital. And about 12 to 24 hours, if we have somebody that comes in that has a procalcitonin of 10, and then we treat them with antibiotics and we see that their procalcitonin has come down uh, in the next um, 48 hours, 24 to 48 hours, then we know the antibiotics that we're utilizing are very effective. What situations though, do we see procalcitonin elevated when it's not a bacterial infection? And procalcitonin is a thinking test. We can't just look at it like a pregnancy test. You're either pregnant or you're not pregnant, right? Procalcitonin is more like a troponin, a high sensitivity troponin, um, where in some cases it might be a little bit elevated if somebody has some renal failure or they have sepsis or some ele other element for troponin. So you have to kind of think about, I have to think about procalcitonin in the right setting. There are some uh, physiologic stressors like severe trauma, surgery, cardiogenic shock, and burns can give you a little bump in procalcitonin in the absence of a bacterial infection. Um, there is some gut transdislocation that occurs. So you'll see a little bumps of procalcitonin in the uh, um, event of some of these other physiological uh, stressors. If we draw the procalcitonin too early, sometimes it'll be uh, falsely low in the, uh, in the uh, uh, event of a bacterial infection. And it's not great for localized infections, abscesses, skin infections. I wish I could have it when people come in and they always seem to blame spiders in the United States when they have a red mark on their arm and they go, I think a spider bit me. And it's hard to tell sometimes, is that a localized allergic reaction 
or do you have an infection? Um, uh, you know, is this allergic or is it an infection? Um, procalcitonin is not great for that. Uh, also not great for otitis media. And when a little guy comes in or a little gal comes in and we're looking to see if they have an uh, otitis media, uh, procalcitonin would not be great in that um, setting, unfortunately. Um, there's also a couple of cancers that can give us some uh, elevated procalcitonins, medullary thyroid cancer, small uh, cell lung cancer. Many times we already know that they have those disease states. Um, and so it doesn't throw us off very well. And again, chronic kidney disease and um, acute kidney injury can give us some elevation in procalcitonin levels. Um, likewise, in the first 48 hours, 72 hours of life, uh, little ones can have a little bump in their procalcitonin. After about that first week, though, um, certainly we have seen a good amount of it used in a pediatric setting. All right, here's my... I'm good. I told you I would disclose my favorite chocolate. This is, my, this is one of my favorite chocolates. I don't know that anybody truly has one favorite chocolate, but this is one of my favorite chocolates, and it's actually from Italy. So if you uh, haven't put in your uh, the country you're from and the chocolate that is your favorite, now you can just put your favorite, not just from uh, the chocolate from the country you're in, but your favorite chocolate, whatever that be, um, please let us know. All right, so this is uh, some ICU randomized controlled trials comparing procalcitonin guided algorithm antibiotic administration as opposed to just standard of care. And what did we see? Well, ICU and intensive care units um, will uh, adapt these protocols. And we saw that the uh, places that adopted the procalcitonin algorithms actually had a positive impact on mortality and reduced antibiotic duration. That's really important when we look at all the data from these different studies that indicates, listen, get the diagnosis right from the beginning and patients don't have to be exposed to antibiotics they don't need and they can get the therapy they need. I'll give you an example. When I have somebody come in, that has a cough and maybe a low grade temperature and they have a history of CHF. And I look at the x-ray and I see bilateral infiltrates. I ask myself, is this heart failure and pneumonia or is this just heart failure? In cases where my procalcitonin is low and in many, I think in these cases as well, when we say, you know what, it is just heart failure. Diurese them, get them tuned up, don't poison them with antibiotics they don't need. What we see is that patients get through the hospital more rapidly and have less exposure to antibiotics and then have better outcomes. And that's not surprising for those of us that have been utilizing procalcitonin for a while. So where do I like to use procalcitonin? Well, shortness of breath. It's the differential diagnosis for shortness of breath is very long. CHF, MI, pericarditis, valvular disease, cardiomyopathy. And I'm going to go through this list because I think it's really important. Does anybody know the differential diagnosis for orthopedic surgery? Very simple. Bone broke, bone not broke. I mean, how hard can that be? So for me, when I'm looking at patients with shortness of breath, I'm asking myself, you know, could this be COPD, asthma, bronchitis, pneumonia, airway obstruction? Could they have a pulmonary embolism? Could they have anemia that's causing it? carbon monoxide poisoning, hyperventilation, COVID, pneumothorax, cardiac tamponade. There's so many reasons why people can feel short of breath. And another place that I use it is when they come in and they can't give me a lot of history, like a nursing home patient. This case number two was a patient that came in. We weren't sure if she was a psychiatric patient or what the situation was. Um, she had a psych history. She's 59 years old with a history of depression and anxiety brought to the emergency department after being seen walking around agitated and talking to herself. Couldn't give me a lot of history. <coughs> she's got a little bit of a cough. I don't know what that means. Is that maybe she, you know, she's encephalopathic because of some infection or is she just simply having a psychotic break? I looked at her vital signs and her heart rate was 121. That didn't bring me any great comfort. Respiratory rate of 20, temperature of 98.2. Pulse X was 100%, which made me feel good and more likely to think, well, eh, she may not necessarily be infected because um, I mean, she's not hypoxic and she doesn't have a fever. 
weight and you see that and her BMI. Previous chart, after I ordered all the tests, I went back and looked and saw that she actually had a history of uh, tachycardia almost all the time. And her heart rate on the last um, visit was 109, which was about her baseline. I still had to work her up though, in case she was infected. And I got a chest X-ray, I had CT, CBC, BMP, uh, CMP rather, UA, EKG, and her procalcitonin, all of which were normal. Lactate was 3.3. So again, I, I couldn't completely rule out an infection. So I gave her some IV fluids and rechecked her lactate and it was 0.8. And probably her lactate was up because she hadn't been eating very well. Uh, because of her psychosis, I admitted her to psychiatry and she did very well. Uh, those of you that uh, practice in the U.S. or other places when you know, we don't want to send sick people to a psychiatric ward uh, many times, at least in the U.S. If they decompensate, they're farther away from the rest of the hospital. The medical care they get is somewhat compromised uh, in, in the event of um, just being on a psych ward. Our medical team doesn't necessarily round on them. So I am always really, really cognizant not to send somebody to psychiatric wards if I have any concern that they're sick. Procalcitonin was a huge, huge portion of my recognizing that she was not infected in that case. So what's our protocol? 0.1 to 0.25 bacterial infection is very unlikely. Antibiotics are definitely discouraged in that setting. 0.26 to 0.5 bacterial infection is much more likely. Antibiotics are encouraged in that setting. And again, where I see somebody with bilateral infiltrates and their procalcitonin is 0.5, much more likely I'm going to start that patient on some antibiotics and give them what other therapy I feel like they need for that current setting. It's 0.51 and above, bacterial infection is very likely and much more um, suggestive of a bacterial infection and antibiotics are strongly encouraged in that setting. All right. So again, uh, for the rest of the world, if you don't understand, I'm an Ohio State guy from Columbus, Ohio. Uh, imagine in your country, your favorite football team, soccer team, whatever sporting team it is. Um, and then imagine your most uh, hated rival, your biggest rivalry competitor, and multiply that times three. And you have a feeling of what it's like for Ohio State and the University of Michigan. Sadly. The University of Michigan and us have exactly the same protocol for procalcitonin. Um, and this year in the rivalry, they did or they did win last year. The big game is coming up this year. Um, it mirrors their uh, treatment of patients, which again just shows us no matter what, uh, if somebody has a low procalcitonin, they probably don't need antibiotics. If they do get higher, then certainly antibiotics seem to fit. And even in Michigan, when you have a high procalcitonin, you should definitely get antibiotics. All right, that's a little tongue in cheek. We really have several friends at the University of Michigan. One of my nieces is there. It's a great institution. Uh, but I just wanted to illustrate that there is a, a great deal of uniformity among uh, practitioners in the US. Then one of the other uh, strong points of procalcitonin is that when the procalcitonin level comes down, uh, less than 0.25 or 80% of the original value. So again, if it starts at 10 and then it comes down to point, or excuse me, it comes down to two, it's decreased by 80%. We can stop the antibiotics. I don't know how we ever all bought into this concept that everybody needs 10 days of antibiotics or two weeks of antibiotics, including, you know, those people with hypertension, diabetes, heart failure, um, are in their 70s and 80s compared to the 20 year old who has no comorbidities. Um, you can't tell me that those two uh, population groups are the same. So one of the nice things about procalcitonin is it helps us truncate when it's safe to stop antibiotics. And that's really important. So it helps us in determining when to start and then when we can stop on patients. And that's why we check them about every 24 to 48 hours once somebody gets in the hospital. All right, so how did we adopt procalcitonin in um, our little hospital. So I was at a conference and I picked up some information on procalcitonin. I thought this looks pretty cool. Talk to some people that were using it. Uh, and this is around 2017 or so. And then I dropped it off with the lab and just kind of left it at that. Um, 
they talk to our laboratory talk to pharmacy and others is particularly those in the antibiotic stewardship um, committee and pharmacy said excuse me yeah hey let's do this this makes sense how can we give practitioners a better way to determine whether somebody needs antibiotics and then how long they need antibiotics the company represented uh, representatives then came out and started to teach us which was interesting because the next time I really thought about this is um, Amy Farley was out giving a lecture at our hospital and I said, wow, this is really great stuff. And so I started using it and um, I, we produced a CME lecture that went on to our clinical uh, or computer based learning so that people could look at um, the education at any time, day or night. Um, I understand my talk was utilized for people that couldn't sleep at night. Uh, and they would say, hey, just watch New Inchwander's talk on procalcitonin. It's a cure for insomnia. Just kidding. Although I, I, it was, you know, my, if, if it helped with that, that's fine. Nonetheless, we did have education at our site, uh, both from the company and ourselves. And then we started to talk about it. We had to put a dock at triage. We were so overwhelmed uh, during COVID that we would put docs out at triage. And many times if they were coming in short of breath, we would push in, you know, chest X-ray, CBC, BMP, troponin, BNP, procalcitonin. And by the time they did get a room in the back, if the procalcitonin was negative and they were COVID positive, many of those folks we were sending home. And I'll share with you some of the data that we based that on. All right. So how do we use it in the emergency department from time zero? We ask ourselves, is there shortness of breath and infection or could it be something else? Is there mental status change from an infection or maybe it's from something else? Is their COVID likely to get worse or is their prognosis good? And again, the lower your procalcitonin is with COVID, the better your prognosis. The higher your, pro your procalcitonin with COVID, the worse your prognosis. So that was one of the elements that we were utilizing to figure out whether to put somebody in the hospital. And it hasn't really changed, even though we don't see as much COVID right now. We certainly um, use it in other, uh, along with other viral um, infections and in particularly with pneumonia. And it provides, procalcitonin uh, provides a level for tracking in the hospital. All right, this is another great case. Uh, it was actually sent to me by a friend. We were chatting about it and I said, that is really a great uh, example of how to use procalcitonin. So she sent it to me, it was at their hospital, 43 year old female with a history of pulmonary arterial hypertension. Uh, she's on continuous oxygen at home. She came to the emergency department for increasing shortness of breath and cough. Uh, there are her vital signs at the bottom, temp of 99.5, heart rate of 121, respiratory rate of 17, blood pressure a little soft from the beginning, 95 over 50, and her O2 sat was 98%. And already she was on a 40% Vinny mask. Um, her labs came back COVID positive, white blood cell count was what we would expect in COVID 3.8, platelets 111, Procal was negative. And this is important. Again, she didn't need antibiotics and uh, she didn't get any antibiotics, which uh, is not surprising. Lactic acid, she wasn't real acidotic, 0.7. But as typical for so many of these patients, um, she didn't have a lot of respiratory reserve and decompensated that day, needed to be intubated uh, day two, she was hypotensive. She needed to, um, she spiked a fever. She required three different uh, pressors, levofed, dobutamine, and vasopressin to maintain a MAP of 65. And anytime you're on three pressors, that's a bad day. Uh, she began being prone for about 16 hours a day. Day 14, it was a long time on event. They check another procalcitonin and it's 3.82. They start antibiotics. And unfortunately, as you can see the CPR in that last little box there, um, she died on day 17, which is unfortunate because what we have to ask ourselves, and this is where we like to utilize it in the hospital is every 24 to 48 hours, get a procalcitonin. On day 14, her procalcitonin was 3.82. So what day was it that she started probably needing antibiotics? Probably, I would estimate, day seven, maybe day eight. Had they done a procalcitonin at that time, could she have received antibiotics and lived? I don't know that we'll ever know, but it certainly makes sense in the inpatient setting to be checking this on an either daily or every other day basis to see if somebody's developed a new pneumonia.
that's now bacterial instead of just the viral pneumonia uh, that they came in with. So bacterial co-infections are a significant risk factor in COVID-19 patients. And we could put that in with influenza A, B, RSV, whatever fill in the blank virus you want to say. And I was talking to a colleague of mine the other day, and I said, you know, that's where procacetone is very helpful. You have, you know, half, about half of all pneumonias are bacterial, half are viral. And if it's just viral, then um, they tend to do much better. And if it's viral and bacterial, they do worse. And she said, oh, you mean two, two types of pneumonia are worse than one? And so it was kind of a little smart aleck remark, but at the same time, it really is accurate. If you have a viral and a bacterial infection, which a lot of viral infections set us up for as a bacterial infection, yes, absolutely, that's worse. And so this was looking, uh, it was a meta-analysis from 14 different studies, about 3,500 patients, bacterial co-infections in about 4.7 to 19.5 of all cases. And uh, about 90% of those patients with severe or a fatal course had co-bacterial infections. And the odds ratio, if you look down there at the bottom in that bottom uh, right-hand box with the red um, lines around it, that your odds ratio was as high as 20.8 with an elevated procalcitonin. So we don't have crystal balls. We don't, we can't always read the future. I wish I had a uh, crystal ball and could read the, um, could read the future. The bottom line is procalcitonin can help us predict who's going to do well and who is not. And these studies actually have some very good evidence to support that. So again, how does it help uh, in the hospital to discharge? Sometimes we uh, antibiotics are started and then stopped, which is great. You know, when I first started, I probably started way more antibiotics and my partner stopped them. Now, when I get somebody with like a COPD exacerbation and I ask them, hey, what do we usually do for you uh, when you have to come in the hospital? And they say, well, I need uh, steroids, uh, breathing treatments. I need uh, that one pain medicine that starts with the D, uh, Delala, Delontin, De Delotted. Mm -hmm. That's it. And some antibiotics. Um, now I know in Central South America, Europe, Asia, the places that that I'm talking to, and especially in Canada, you don't have pain. You don't have patients asking for pain medicines. Um, but unfortunately, in the U.S., many times we do. So. When I do put COPDers in and I've used a procalcitonin that's low, I can tell them, you're right. We're going to give you steroids. We're going to give you breathing treatments. And your procalcitonin is low, so we don't need to poison you with antibiotics. And you don't need Dilaudid. Um, and there are some cases then that we stop. Sometimes antibiotics are not started. But then with their COPD, it gets worse in the hospital. And then sometimes they'll add in the antibiotics later. And sometimes we start antibiotics in the emergency department and they're not working, and then we change them. All right, so let's talk about the economics, because that's always, you know, when things come down to it, where's the cheese? How are we going to get this into our hospital? The One of the ways that we looked at this was how much money could we save by using procalcitonin instead of giving antibiotics? So this was a cost impact of procalcitonin guided antibiotic stewardship versus usual care for hospitalized patients with suspected sepsis for lower respiratory tract infections in the U.S., a health economic model analysis. And basically what they were looking at is they were comparing the effectiveness and cost of procalcitonin algorithm versus standard of care to guide antibiotic prescriptions in patients hospitalized with a diagnosis of suspected sepsis or lower respiratory tract infections. Again, a U.S. study um, and if you want to translate this into your countries, remember U.S. citizens, most of us are mammals. So this data should definitely uh, translate to whatever country you're in. And what did they see? The cost impact of procalcitonin guided antibiotic stewardship versus usual care showed that antibiotic days using procalcitonin were reduced by 5.8. So again, we could see those patients that didn't need antibiotics and didn't give them antibiotics. The, the episodes of C. diff were decreased for a cost savings of over $16,000. I was down in Houston um, 
and I was giving a talk. I think it was for part of the antibiotic stewardship week. And I stood up and I said, Hey, how many people hate the smell of C. diff? And almost everybody raised their hand. And I said, if you want less C. diff, quit using some of And I dropped the mic and dropped and said, that's it. That's my whole talk. All right. So it's not quite that easy, of course. But you want less C. diff? Give patients less antibiotics. Very simple equation. And we know that it's a cost savings to the hospital of about $16,000 every time we don't give somebody C. diff. And many times that comes by not giving somebody antibiotics they don't need. We save about 330 bucks uh, a patient that uh, on antibiotics, uh, mechanical ventilation for those patients, again, that we get the diagnosis right on, uh, we'll save about $2,100 with procalcitonin as opposed to usual care. Um, $86 in lab testing. So you say, well, oh, we're doing an extra lab test. This means that we're going to do more lab testing. Procalcitonin is not a, a very expensive lab test. Uh, I don't want to say uh, the price for your countries because I really don't know. But in the U.S., most of the times it's less than $20. So I don't know how that translates into yours, but um, I can get uh, a couple of burritos and um, some soft drinks here in the U.S. Uh, for less than 20 bucks for my beautiful wife and I. So the overall cost savings per patient was over $11,000 for patients that had procalcitonin guided antibiotic stewardship. Again, uh, this is the cost impact of patients, uh, usual care for hospitalized patients, suspected sepsis for lower respiratory tract uh, infections. Um, an, another meta-analysis also showed an antibiotic days were uh, about five days, 31,000 in the C. diff area. Uh, antibiotics, about 290, very similar numbers. Vents, uh, excuse me, um, mechanical ventilation, uh, $221. Again, these were less um, ill patients, so not as many of them were on the vent. Lab testing a little bit more uh, in the procalcitonin group and saved over $2,868. So again, these are patients that were not in the ICU, but even if we're using it for non-ICU patients, you're still saving uh, close to $2,800, which is a big cost savings to us uh, in the United States on a patient. So again, review. Um, we wanted to discuss procalcitonin antibiotic stewardship and sepsis and lower respiratory tract infections, illustrate the impact of procalcitonin on emergency department um, and ICU decision making, and demonstrate the economic benefits of procalcitonin. So that is uh, the end of my formal presentation. If you didn't get your favorite chocolate or whatever your chocolate is, please throw that in the chat along with whatever questions you have. I'll be happy to answer those. And once again, folks, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you for Abbott for sponsoring this um, learning uh, venue. And I hope that we can talk soon. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Neuenschwander, for your informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the left of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we have time for. Let's get started. Our first question is, can procalcitonin be elevated without infection? Yes, uh, there are some places where we will see procalcitonin be up a little bit, uh, such as surgery, trauma, burns. Um, with some gut trans dislocation, there are certain cancers that can do that. Thyroid um, cancer can, and there are some lung cancers that can as well. Uh, generally, those numbers are not very high and don't have a great impact. And oftentimes we already know that those conditions are present. So it's again, just putting it in that context and utilizing um, that information. Great, thank you. Our next question is, what can falsely elevate pro procalcitonin or falsely decreased, false negative? Um, so sometimes it can look like a false negative if it's, if it's too early in the course, like if somebody comes in before um, it's had a peak at 24 hours and so we can see it falsely low. Uh, some of those other things that we talked about previously, we can see it elevated a tad in, in um, or we can see it elevated in burns, trauma, uh, abdominal surgeries. And those are really the things to take into consideration. Localized infections, 
cellulitis may not bump procalcitonin, even in the um, presence of a bacterial infection. Uh, and endocarditis is another place that disappointingly doesn't have a big increase in procalcitonin. Awesome. Our next question is, how long does bro does procalcitonin stay elevated? Good question. Uh, it starts to go up in about two to six hours and it stays elevated for 24 hours. If um, we treat it with an appropriate antibiotic, we'll start to see it come down um, within that 24 hour range. But generally we can see it peak and hang around uh, in about 24 hours. So about a day, uh, about a day. Great. Our next question is, which inflammatory marker is better, CRP or procalcitonin? Uh, CRP takes longer to go up. It's not as specific uh, or as sensitive for bacterial infections. So I got to give the nod to procalcitonin in this case. Um, it is uh, certainly the one I go to. There are certain things I like a CRP for if I'm worried about a joint infection, something like that. It certainly seems to be a good place for it. Um, pediatrics uh, with um, appendicitis, yet uh, overall, uh, the vast majority of the time when I'm trying to differentiate between a viral versus a bacterial infection. And why I want to know that is that I know about 50% of all pneumonias are viral, right? And so what is one nice thing that COVID gave us was that when I talk to patients and I say, listen, this is a virus, it is not going to respond to antibiotics because antibiotics are um, medicine or poison to kill bugs. And it's like bug spray and, and, and COVID and all these other viruses are more like elephants, right? And if you spray an elephant with bug spray, it's not going to do anything. So we don't need to spray your viral infection with bug spray. It's a virus. We have other treatments for it. You don't need antibiotics. Great. Um, how do high levels Oh, wait, sorry. Um, yes. How do high levels of procalcitonin interfere with calcitonin levels or vice versa? Wait, say it again. How does it affect calcitonin? How do calcitonin? high levels of procalcitonin interfere with calcitonin levels or vice versa? Uh, they actually don't interfere with calcitonin levels. So if there was a reason that you were checking that, um, there certainly wouldn't be any interference from procalcitonin. Great. Thank you. Um, are there any POC point of care analyzers used right in ED in the USA? Well, I wish there were, uh, to be perfectly fair. I don't know of any that do, but it would be nice to have that back, particularly like we get plenty of people that just come in and they're like COVID positive and they come to the emergency department and they need a work excuse or they need to um, be evaluated. A quick uh, procalcitonin in that case would be awesome. And there's other people that come in and they, you know, they've been sick for a week with a bronchitis or potentially an atypical pneumonia. I would love to just do a finger stick and get a, a procalcitonin on them, but I am not aware of any um, point of care testing. That's a great idea. If you come up with the idea, let me know because I want to buy it and use it. Great. Thank you. And it looks like our last question for today. Um, we know that PCT levels can be elevated in patients with acute or chronic renal failure or on dialysis. How do you elevate PCT when managing these patients? Evaluate. So, yeah, evaluate. <laughs> <laughs> Already elevated. You're doing great. You're doing great. Um, yeah, that's a, a, we actually, you know, we did a study at our shop where we looked at patients that anybody that got vancomycin automatically had a procalcitonin level drawn. And then we had the pharmacy team, which are the antibiotic stewards, follow it. So if you started low and continued low, they would call the doc and go, hey, listen, it was low from the beginning. It's still low now. Do we really need the antibiotics? And most of the docs said, no, we don't. Uh, we even did that with end-stage renal disease patients. And we had some patients that came in and their procalcitonin levels were low, despite the fact that they didn't clear it as well because of their end-stage renal disease or were on um, dialysis. And then we had some people that came in and their procal level would be one, and then it just stayed one and it was flat. So what we saw was that if you can have a baseline for people that have end-stage renal disease, that you can actually follow the trend. If it's going up, then certainly then the concern for a bacterial infection is greater. Um, if it's going down and you've given antibiotics and they seem to be working, but if it's flat, then there's a pretty good chance you're not dealing with, I don't know if that was completely flat. Did that look like it went across flat? I was watching. <laughs> um, 
but if it stays flat, then the likelihood is you're probably dealing with a virus. So I still want to do that study. I've been trying to talk Thermo and Abbott into letting me do a study where I draw um, procalcitonins on patients undergoing hemodialysis and then follow them for a year while they're in the hospital and just see what their procalcitonin levels do. So it is helpful in the setting of um, end-stage renal disease or kidney failure patients, but again, more as a trend than as a single number. Great, and it looks like we have a few more questions coming in here. How do you look at patients with possible possible atypical pneumonia or low procalcitonin levels? Do you consider false negative levels in this case? So atypical pneumonias, uh, so if you get like a mycoplasma, they'll still have a little bump in their procal. It's sometimes, you know, we've looked at studies, Dr. Self did a study of over a thousand patients. And when they looked at uh, atypical pneumonias, they were still between 0.25 and 0.5 on average. So you do see a little bit of a bump considering the fact that 0.25 is kind of that base level that I'll start using um, procalcitonin. As far as false uh, negatives, um, again, the clinical picture, when I see a COPD here and, and they have, you know, gross yellow sputum and they're having, uh, you know, other symptoms that might make me think of an atypical pneumonia, then certainly in that situation. But I got to tell you, the majority of times uh, when they're having those symptoms where they're bringing up, you know, um, darker sputum and things like that, I do find that their procalcitonin levels are up. Um, and those are the folks that I go ahead and, and give antibiotics to. Great. And are there critical levels considered for PCT? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, anytime you get above uh, 1.0, you have to be concerned about sepsis, right? I mean, and that's what everybody's concerned about is sepsis. How worried should I be about this person who's sitting in front of me right now eating a bag of Doritos on their cell phone? Um, and they may not look that bad, but their procalcitonin level is up and you go, ooh, this is a bad marker or this is a marker for you to do poorly. Um, so in those levels where, uh, or when I do see those levels above 0.5, I get much more concerned that somebody is going to get septic and get into a lot of trouble, uh, very soon down the line. And I don't want to send them home and start my shift the next day or two. And somebody goes, Hey, do you remember that, uh, person you sent home the other day, their procalcitonin was 0.6. And I go, Oh no. And I find out that they came back and now they're uh, hospitalized or have a breathing tube and, uh, and I feel awful. So when I see those numbers high, those are kind of critical numbers for me. Those are, again, markers for me that this patient could indeed have something um, that's going to portend a bad outcome for them. Great. Thank you. That looks like that's the end of our Q&A for today. Um, do you have any final comments for our audience? Hey, thanks for all the comments about the chocolate. Um, you know, that was my daughter's idea to put in the chat and find out. <clears throat> she actually took a course at Ohio State. I paid for it um, on a chocolate. The whole class was just chocolate. And she said, I want to hear about uh, the different type of chocolates around the world. So we hope to come visit you in Argentina. And we saw some others from Finland uh, and other countries. Uh, some of the language I couldn't ever understand, but I did screenshot these. And uh, we can't wait to um, come try out some of these different chocolates in uh, these different places around the world. So thanks everybody for participating. Uh, if you want, uh, we can certainly send you a list of some of the great chocolates so you can have that too. And if you want any other information on procalcitonin, we'll be happy to get that to you as well. Again, thanks to Abbott for sponsoring this and Lab Roots for doing such an excellent job. And we're grateful to uh, everybody for joining us today. And that's all for me. Awesome. Thank you again, Dr. Nguyen-Schwander for your time today and your important research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Abbott, for underwriting today's educational webcast. Before we go, I'd like to thank the audience for joining us today and their interesting questions. Questions we do not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information provided at the time of registration. This webcast can be viewed on demand. LabRoots will alert you via email when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. Until next time, bye. See you, everybody.